Council for today's celebrations recognizes 2010 as the year of peace in Africa under the slogan, Make Peace Happen. I'm determined to do my part in pushing for greater progress on the MDGs and enabling the continent to achieve its full economic, political, and social potential. On this very happy Africa Day, let us rededicate ourselves to our partnership in the pursuit of peace and progress for all Africa's people. And I thank you very much and congratulations. The credits at the end, they have the family name Hamad, and guess who their dad is? <laughs> so I told you, they're very smart and really good looking kids, and uh, let's welcome Dr. Hamad. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be in Europe. Actually, my wife is from Europe. She's, she's born in England, raised in Australia. Uh, we married in America, and she will die in Sudan. God knows where she's going to die. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here. Actually, I showed this video just to show also our appreciation to Reverend Injin Moon for providing for us the Manhattan Center uh, to hold this, uh, the fruit of our partnership with the United Nations. Thank you, Reverend Injin Moon, for all the support. Uh, but uh, we we can't claim anything for ourselves. This is a teaching of Father and Mother Moon, go with the heart of a parent and in the shoes of a servant. That is what we did at the United Nations. Uh, for many years, we've been working very silently without uh, uh, pointing things to ourselves, helping, working in a partnership with NGOs, with the uh, the diplomatic community with the secretariat, uh, we build relationships day in, day out. And uh, center on that kind of relationships, we, we've been called actually by the African Union to come and organize this uh, Africa Day. And uh, this is one of uh, the major, basically, quote unquote, uh, date in the, uh, in the African calendar. And uh, they were very happy three days after that. Uh, they called us to come to the African Union headquarters. I went there. Uh, we signed a memorandum of understanding uh, to work with them together in a project called Sleeping Sickness, uh, which uh, come uh, through a, a, a fly called this, if this fly, bite people, let them sleep till they die. So they ask us to wake people up. No, they ask us to work with them <laughs> cooperatively to find a way through the international network we have in the world to find a way uh, to combat this disease in Africa. It actually uh, uh, costs Africa $4.2 billion every year. Uh, and also uh, 50,000 people die every year from, every year from this disease. Uh, it happened to be that uh, we have very good contacts in, in, uh, in other parts of the world, especially uh, some contacts who have money in China. Uh, in February 2011, there was a summit for the African leaders. There were about uh, 50 head of state there, we went there. 
and we introduce uh, our, our partnership uh, with the business community to the AU and uh, they committed uh, for a big amount of money to fall towards the eradication of the disease. So we work with uh, the AU, uh, center of the government, work with the business, uh, work with the NGO. We create venue, we create inroads toward these, these different entities to achieve the ultimate concern, which is building God's kingdom on earth. Uh, we are not there yet, but we are trying. Nevertheless, our Father, we have found that Reverend Moon and Mother Moon, everywhere we go, we find that they have created a foundation for us to stand upon. In Africa, in China, in, in South America, everywhere, wherever we, Europe, of course, Europe, 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 Europe there is a foundation, a strong foundation for partnership and working together. We are an NGO, have a consultative status at the United Nations. We try to utilize that to create this partnership and to advance the work of building God's kingdom or building peace on earth, just like the United Nations trying to do. Speaking about the United Nations, one of the major contributions I believe Father Moon have done to the United Nations is the uh, what, suggestion or the proposal for establishment of the Interreligious Council at the UN. To say it very undiplomatically, he wants God to be the center of the United Nations. Any objection to that? No. Thank you. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Uh, if the United Nations is talking about peace, and they cannot create peace till now from the reality which we see, although there are a lot, a lot, a lot of good things the United Nations have done, but peace is still far away and distant, we have to call on, we have to call upon the origin of peace, which is God himself. Father Moon, in his intimate wisdom, uh, ultimate wisdom, he have, uh, uh, came in 2000, uh, 18 of August, and proposed the establishment of the Interreligious Council at the United Nations. We know the situation of the world, we know the, the past century, we have two big uh, uh, world wars, the devastation is incredible. So, uh, the, uh, the Second World War involved 61 nations, uh, 80 million people wounded, 60 million died. And, and, and the story is, is just glimpsed, uh, very dim of, uh, of, of the world in relationship to peace. And the United Nations was established to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And, and to affirm human rights, and dignity of human beings and all that. Uh, but still, there is poverty and inequality in the world. There's a violation of human rights everywhere. Uh, at the beginning of the millennium, uh, the head of states, the largest gathering of head of states, uh, 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 issue the millennium uh, development goals, which are eight goals that are well known to those who are working in the area of peace. These Millennium Goals are still yet to be achieved by the year 2015. There is some progress being done, but there is still a lot to be done. Because the instrument through which this Millennium Goal are supposed to be achieved is still need reform as many people have, have recognized. And uh, the, Uni the United Nations today, if you look at it, find that uh, is, there is an area of concern uh, of nationalisms, uh, every nation is looking for their own benefits, uh, there is anti-religion there, and there is uh, also a redefinition of the family which we believe is a, a cornerstone for building God's kingdom or for building peace on earth. Uh, I'm going very fast because time is uh, limited. But uh, I wanted to acknowledge, by all means, the United Nations is a great institution, has a great vision, but it is yet to be accomplished. And it needs an oomph, it needs some push. And that push, I believe, was the introduction of Father Moon of the, uh, the Interreligious Council at the United Nations uh, in August 18, 2000. And, uh, 
uh, there is a lot of, of course, there is a, 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 an understanding behind why we need a religion to be part of the religious, uh, uh, well, religion to be part of the political uh, path, but not a religion which could hinder, but a religion which could bring wisdom and augment the political process. Uh, bring in, not take out uh, from the political process, work again in partnership and cooperation. So that uh, uh, proposal of establishing an interreligious council at the United Nations was presented to one of our best supporters uh, in the Philippines, uh, Jose Dominici Jr., picked up that and said, this is a great idea, we have to make this happen. Uh, he talked to, at that time, Gondeliza Rice, uh, he talked to the, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, and uh, the, uh, the mission of Philippines uh, spearheaded this project which Father Moon have uh, brought into existence. And as Dr. Walsh have mentioned, since that uh, proposal was presented at the United Nations, the face of the UN started changing bit by bit. People start talking about religion, about interreligious dialogue, about let's come together. Before that, you speak about religion, people say to you, what are you talking about? Really, seriously. For NGO to speak about religion, we created a caucus called the Values Caucus. So we could just talk about values or universal values, something kind of big, not specific. But uh, when Father Moon came and presented this, proposal, it really brings uh, the debate into focus and, and people are more aware of the importance of religion. Uh, in the UN, everything takes time and takes step by step. These are the steps which has been taken so far now. If you look, there is a lot of, a lot of work being done uh, through partnership, uh, working with the government, working among NGO, and there were uh, uh, steps being taken uh, towards the establishment of the Interreligious Council. Uh, just in general, uh, these are more the, the details of it, but this is in general. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, the founding vision was established in 2000, and then 2004, there was a resolution from the, inter from, uh, the Security Council to, to promote interreligious dialogue, which never happened before in the UN. 2005, Tripartite was of Interface Forum was formed uh, in partnership with the NGO, the, uh, the, the, the United Nations and the Secretariat, 2005, establishing a focal point in the Secretary General Office, and 2010, uh, which is last year, they established what is called the World Interface Harmony Week. And this is happy to coincide with our Founder was Reverend and Mrs. Moon a birth, uh, birthday in February, and uh, there was a resolution from the United Nations, which was spearheaded by five by seven nations uh, in front of you: Bahrain, Jordan, Oman, uh, Azerbaijan, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. And that resolution basically encouraged uh, nations to push their religious institutions so they may serve and work and amplify the goodness in other religions, not in their own religion. And that is basically what Father Moon is from the beginning of saying, in the heart of a parent and the shoes of a servant. The parents work for the benefit of the children, and the children are all the children. So the Interreligious Council is work in progress. Of course, there are challenges in front of us, uh, how it could be formed, uh, who, what the representation is, uh, how do we select the religious leaders, all those, and that is why there were consultation worldwide. Uh, some of it happened here in, in Europe and worldwide, and this consultation is still going on, and we definitely uh, are working to uh, meet those challenges and to work with the ambassador of peace like you and our uh, membership worldwide uh, to bring this uh,
vision into uh, to bring this vision to pass. Thank you very much for your attention and God bless you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamad, for that uh, short, concise, but very informative uh, presentation about the work with the UN. And it's very exciting, isn't it? Um, now we come on to our main speaker for this afternoon, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce him. He's the uh, seventh and the youngest son of Dr. and Mrs. Moon, and uh, he's a graduate uh, of Harvard uh, Graduate School of Theology. He also has an undergraduate degree in philosophy from Harvard and an honorary degree in uh, theology from Sun Moon University in Korea. In 2008, he was appointed international president of the Unification Church, and then in the beginning of 2009, was designated by his father, Reverend uh, Moon, to head up on his behalf the worldwide movement. Later the same year, he was also appointed as chairman of UPF, as you heard from Dr. Walsh. One of the really interesting things about uh, Reverend Moon, Young Jin Moon, is that he not only is a student of theology and religion, but really a practitioner. And that's one of the things that I think those of you who, like myself and others who have encountered him, really feel that he very much embodies this sort of interreligious spirit in his understanding intellectually, but also in his lifestyle. And uh, this is a very inspiring thing. You know, one of the happier moments in my week, suddenly, and I think in many of us in the Unification Church, is the opportunity to either read or listen or watch a video of him and also his sister uh, giving uh, talks at their various uh, church services. It is most inspiring, and I hope that those of you who may not have had, had the opportunity will do so uh, once you hear him speaking today. So let's really, and since he's here, by the way, also at the request of and representing his father, Reverend Moon, uh, let's really welcome him as if we are welcoming his father to this hall. So why don't you give him a really warm round of applause. when I have to address uh, such a distinguished, distinguished crowd. Um, and I really want to thank uh, Dr. Walsh and Dr. Hamad and all the organizers of today's event uh, for such a wonderful uh, event. We're so happy uh, to be here in Europe, especially with Father and Mother Moon at this time. Uh, they will not only be traveling in Europe, but also uh, to various countries in the Middle East. Uh, uh, working with the Abrahamic faiths there, as you know, in this time of, uh, of uh, uh, change in that region. So we're very excited, we're very thankful uh, that they are here. They decided to come uh, and they will be addressing all of you uh, tomorrow at the main event. One thing that um, came to mind uh, when I was uh, listening to Dr. Walsh and also Dr. Hamad was that in the study of religion, uh, it is very common to look at religion in various lenses. So we can look at religion from a social perspective or sociological perspective and say that it is maybe an evolutionary need uh, or it is helpful for society to believe in a religion or in religions. Uh, that is, it is beneficial for the human uh, species as a society to believe and hold uh, religious values and, and uphold traditions of religion. We can also look at religion and analyze it in an economic uh, dimension, which is also common in the study of religion, uh, seeing that religion is really a move towards power or economic strength. And that many times nation states, kings, monarchies have used religion uh, in such ways. We can also look at religion uh, in a sort of political, with a political an uh, analysis. I see religion as really a political entity uh, that can be used uh, for very various political means. But during my studies, and one thing I was very grateful for in the study of religion was also the additional phenomenological approach, which is to say that 
religions, of course, within each type of religious organization, especially if it's a world religion, there are elements of sociology. There are elements of uh, needs that need to be addressed in the human person uh, as, or human animal within our society. There are also economic uh, realities that every religion must address. And also there are political aspects, ecclesiastical aspects within all traditions uh, that we have, that we see are very much alive. But to limit religion to those spheres only is to, uh, to do the, uh, the error of not understanding that religion also has a phenomenological aspect, that it has something beyond the political, something beyond the social, and also something beyond the economic needs of, hu of, of a human person. That religion fundamentally is connecting us uh, with something that is transcendent of ourselves and, and to our ultimate purpose. So I think, uh, for me, it's always critical uh, to remind ourselves when we do look at religions, and particularly when Father and Mother Moon uh, have initiated um, councils of religion at the UN, that we understand that religions are much more than political or social or economic entities. They are truly rooted uh, in the principles we believe of God. Um, the religions that have uh, lasted the course of time, that have been able to persevere uh, through the generations. Uh, uh, not only was Jesus a social activist, or uh, uh, his group was his disciples and himself uh, trying to uh, uh, settle maybe an, uh, or, or to work to uh, create an economic foundation or even a political foundation, but that Christ himself was much more than that. He was. Uh, uh, phenomenologically inspired. He was beyond those things. Uh, we could say the same with the prophets of the ages and also the, uh, the writers of the biblical text, that they are not only motivated in, uh, in either political or social or economic uh, ways, but they are motivated in deep spiritual yearning and deep spiritual searching. I think that aspect is so essential because many times in the study of religion, there is a, uh, there can be a tendency uh, to, to uh, 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 sort of reduce, uh, go, up, go into the reductionist mode and see religion as simply a human entity. I think what Father Moon is calling us to recognize is that it is not only a human institution, but that it is God himself that inspires uh, the great faith traditions. And so that is why it is so essential uh, for the, um, uh, for UPF, also, as you know, as a Unification Church, um, uh, for us to always be uh, engaged in interreligious uh, uh, dialogue and also in living. I myself uh, had a great experience of uh, uh, when, my, uh, when I was in college, uh, my brother, who was very close to me, passed away, and it was the first time that I really experienced uh, the death of a loved one at a very young age. It was very shocking and uh, very painful. But what I realized is that uh, this was not a unique experience to myself. And uh, I was attending a Catholic university at the time. I uh, wanted to study Buddhism, uh, and so moved to Harvard. I studied uh, uh, different faiths, lived with Tibetan monks, uh, lived with Korean monks, um, had a great time. Uh, in spending time with the world's religions, uh, uh, in uh, Benedictine monasteries. Um, in those experiences, I have found a richness and uh, uh, treasures that I hold on to this day. And for us, uh, in our main temple in the Unification Church, uh, that, which is in Korea, we have in, uh, enshrined uh, the great uh, faith traditions, all the faith traditions are represented. It's a very unique, I believe, headquarters of any world religion um, to see uh, uh, acknowledgement of Christ, of the Buddha, of Confucius, of Islam, recognized as, as uh, uh, children and uh, movements that God has inspired throughout time. Uh, I think it's essential I believe for us, uh, in order to have a deeper understanding of Father Moon, 
uh, to understand also the unificationist perspective. Uh, we, we do not only view Father Moon as a man. Uh, we don't only view him in the unification movement as simply uh, a social activist or peace activist. We see him in a messianic mission. That is the mission of the Lord of the Second Advent where he is working as the Christ that has returned. And I think this is fundamental um, to understand why he, he engages himself at the risk of uh, bitter persecution, torture, imprisonment, um, uh, immense opposition, uh, to continue to promote uh, the values of God, the values of the family, the values of, uh, of, of of, ideal, of the ideal world, and especially of inheriting the true love of God. I think for us, um, for myself, uh, uh, whenever I reflect on uh, Father and Mother Moon, uh, for me, it is absolutely essential to keep that framework in mind uh, when I then look at their worldwide activities and their lifelong course that they have walked. Uh, I, would, I have a brief uh, uh, prepared speech uh, that I would like to share with you all. And, uh, and I'm very grateful once again to be able to have the privilege and opportunity to address you here today. Distinguished parliamentarians, leaders from civil society, and ambassadors for peace. It's my high, high honor and privilege to have this opportunity to address you here today in the Norwegian parliament a place of rich history and a tradition of good govern governance. I thank the members of Parliament who made today's meeting in this venue possible. Thank you so much. I also want to thank both the Universal Peace Federation of Europe and the Women's Federation for Peace, World Peace Europe, for convening this uh, European Leadership Conference uh, on building a world of universal peace at a time of global crisis. Our meeting here in this place devoted uh, to public service and the public good is, I believe, an expression of our mutual commitment to, to discover the path to lasting peace. And I'm sure that God's blessing is here upon all of us today. This morning, I, I'm sorry, this evening, I would like to share with you a few words on behalf of my parents, the Reverend and, and Dr. Sun Myung Moon, Father and Mother Moon, who have embarked on a global tour to share this vision of peace centered on God's providence at this time in history. Tomorrow uh, we will all be attending uh, his Father and Mother Moon's main message at the Bristol Hotel here in Oslo. And as we reflect upon peace, we realize that peace is not simply the cessation of conflict. Rather, as we have learned from the great teachers and prophets of the ages, Peace is much more than a political, economic, or military accomplishment. Peace is rooted in the quality of our own character, the quality of our relationships, and ultimately, and most importantly, our relationship with God, the Creator. The founders and sages of the great religions have recognized that when we are lacking in spiritual discipline and wisdom, peace is not possible. Peace arises when we are in a right relationship with God, with our mind and body, with our family, and also with, our, with nature and the created world. If we are people of internal struggle, selfishness, and sin, alienated from God, our efforts in this world will eventually lead to struggle and conflict. Father Moon teaches us that the root of peace is the God-centered family. And for this reason, he has championed the international and interreligious World Peace Holy Blessing Ceremonies, bringing together couples from every corner of the world, calling each to dedicate their marriage and family to God's ideal of true love and universal peace. Father and Mother Moon teach that there is no better way to create a world of peace than by strengthening marriages and building God-centered families of true love. The fall of Adam and Eve and the consequent murder of Abel and Cain illustrates Abel by Cain illustrates the point that God's original ideal was to establish a family of true love. The fall was the violation of this ideal, 
passed down through the ages from one generation to the next. And restoration can only be achieved when this original ideal of paradigm of the God-centered family is achieved. That is the mission that true parents have taken up. And hence we refer, them, refer to them as the true parents of heaven and earth and humankind. They teach that on the foundation of the God-centered blessed family, the realm of peace can be expanded to ever widening range of other levels such as a tribe or a society, nation and world, and thus naturally will emerge the kingdom of God. Within the Christian tradition, uh, the kingdom of God is understood as a world of peace, a world that fulfills the hope of all ages and all religions for a united world of peace. Jesus prayed the Lord's Prayer and taught the Lord's Prayer with the words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. The emphasis on thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Jesus also called his disciples to repent and to forgive their enemies, to work to deliver humanity from the bondage of sin. And as important as political and secular social movements have been and continue to be, God's central providence throughout history has been led by the founders of the great religions. That process continues today. We ignore, if we ignore the essential and necessary points of religion, we, would, we do so only at our peril and against the reality of history. Those who advocate atheism, moral relativism, selfish materialism, can lead, are leading a humanity down a wrong path that leads to spiritual poverty and spiritual destruction. For this reason, each of us as citizens, professionals, and leaders, as mothers and fathers and sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, should seek to center ourselves on God's true love or His essence. For God calls us away from selfishness and self-serving behaviors and toward a life lived for the sake of others, and this is the path to peace. Knowing the importance of religion, my Father has called even the United Nations to include the great faith traditions in its noble mission and establish an interreligious council within the United Nations system. Otherwise, as he has taught, the efforts of the UN will fall short of their objectives and humanity as a whole will suffer. Of course, we must also be watchful of the distortions of religion expressed in various forms of fanaticism and or the promotion of violence we must rather tap into the spiritual core of religion, which is rooted in the true love of the parent-child relationship between God and human beings, truly learning to love, to live for the sake of the other, sacrificing oneself. My father has great respect for the United Nations. Had it not been for the United Nations Peace Force, comprised of 16 nations, not only would the nation of South Korea not exist as a free and democratic society where religion has flourished, but, not, but neither would my father have survived to carry out his providential mission. Nor, needless to say, neither would I be here. Almost, that's quite obvious. Yeah. <laughs> Almost exactly 60 years ago, on uh, October 14th, 1950, my father was about to be executed in one of the uh, uh, North Korean concentration camps uh, known as Hungnam Prison. He had been imprisoned there for almost three years by the communist authorities who viewed his bold ministry and strong faith as a threat to their atheistic regime. On that very day, miraculously, the United Nations forces liberated my father from Hungnam Prison and the late General Alexander Haig, former United States Secretary of State and NATO Commander, and later in life a longtime friend of Father Moon, was a close friend of Douglas MacArthur and a leader among the Allied forces conducting the bombing raid that liberated my father and spread him and other prisoners from and spared him from certain death. It was just over ten years ago, August 2000, that Father Moon outlined his vision for the Interreligious Council in a speech he delivered at the United Nations just prior to the Millennium General Assembly. He explained that the UN would not be able to fulfill its mission without creating a council 
that would uphold the spiritual wisdom and heritage of humanity, representing God's guidance for us all. And this council would therefore function as a spiritual compass and a conscience. This council would ex include exemplary and mature representatives and learned advocates of the world's spiritual traditions. While we most often hear the mainstream mass media speak negatively or pejoratively, even selectively, about the role of religion in society, those who are better informed recognize that this is only one part of the whole story, that there are millions of people of faith working together for peace, societal building, faith communities, etc. There are thousands and many thousands of faith-based organizations, as well as interfaith organizations, that serve humanity as an expression of their love and obedience to God's will. People of faith everywhere share a strong desire for peace and realize that peace is an ideal that stands at the center of their sacred scriptures. My father has referred to his ideal for a new United Nations system as the ABLE UN. Like ABLE in biblical history, the UN should seek God's guidance. Lasting solutions to our global problems and a comprehensive peace cannot be realized without a spiritual awakening and the full participation of those who affirm and practice spiritual principles. I believe all of you can appreciate the value of Father Moon's proposal for the world's foremost political body. It is an idea whose time has truly come. Recently, the United Nations General Assembly has passed a number of resolutions calling for interfaith cooperation. These resolutions derive from the vision of my father as advanced by the work of UPF. Father Moon was called to his great messianic mission by God in a direct encounter with Christ when he was only 16 years old, praying on a North Korean hilltop. In 1960, he established the position of true parents together with my mother, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, and they stand in the position of true parents with the mission to fulfill the mission of Jesus and complete God's providence at this time in history, working hand in hand with God-centered people of all faiths. At the Assembly of the World's Religions, convened in 80, 1985, Father Moon gathered leaders from all faiths, and he called for the production of an anthology of sacred texts, showing the common values shared by all religions. This resulted in the publication of World Scripture, an anthology of sacred texts, a volume that shows the universal spiritual values shared by the world's religions. My father has canonized the world's scripture text as one of the essential texts in the canon of the Unification Church. Recently, my father also pu published his autobiography entitled, As a Peace-Loving Global Citizen. It has been at the top of the bestseller list in Korea for almost two years and now in Taiwan. It has also been published in English and in other languages. And I encourage all of you to read this fascinating, personal, and inspiring book. I believe through it, you will learn about Father Moon's vision, his character, his life, uh, his, his uh, background, how, in what situation he grew up, and his mission at this time in history. Indeed, through this autobiography, I invite each one of you to seek to understand the heart with which he has also fervently and ardently pursued his mission to bring about lasting world peace and the kingdom of God. In conclusion, I want to thank each one of you who represent the people of this great nation, the world's great faith traditions, and humanity. May your experience during this ELC over the next few days and in the next lectures be enriching and enlightening. It is our prayer that it is so. And let us work together to build one family under God and a world of universal peace. We're all called to play a central role in God's providence at this time. And I know that true parents pray about this each and every day. I want to thank you once again for your attendance here and for your respectful attention to my humble address. God bless you, thank you, and God bless you.
you very much, Dr. Moon. It is always a pleasure to hear you speak and also to share so sincerely about his parents. I know that for some of you this is news, and I think that uh, he mentioned about the autobiography as a peace-loving global citizen. Uh, we will have a talk about that after dinner this evening back at the hotel. Uh, Mr. Tim Miller, our European Vice President of UPF, will be introducing that book, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to avail yourself of a copy. Just to give you sort of a glimpse, I think many of you have heard of the song uh, The Impossible Dream from Man of La Mancha, right? I think nobody embodies that idea, to my knowledge, in this world today than uh, Father Moon, having really gone through hell for a heavenly cause. And what is amazing for all of us here is that he is now in Oslo, waiting to meet you tomorrow. You can't miss that. like also, you know, he is now 91 years old. Why would he travel around the world at the age of 91 to talk all over the world? Why would a man do that? He's either got to be crazy or he's got something really important to say. So he's coming here to Norway, I believe, for the first time. So let's really, uh, you know, prepare this opportunity to welcome him with all of our hearts. This may be the only opportunity he will have to visit here, and he's very much looking forward to meeting everybody. So thanks once again, uh, Dr. Moon, for your uh, wonderful talk this afternoon. Now a few, some mundane things. Um, we're going to take a group photo downstairs in front right after this. So when you leave here, go as quickly as you can downstairs, by stairs or by the elevator. Um, and also, did I say elevator? Yeah, elevator. Lift. Sorry, the lift over here, right? Um, also, uh, because there's another program beginning here at 6 o'clock, take all of your belongings with you and also cups and other garbage. There's a plastic bag at the back. Please drop it off there. And then make your way as quickly as possible. Just a moment. Very important. We're going to have dinner this evening. Isn't that important? Okay, so we're going to be going to a restaurant this evening. Uh, we'll be led by our staff there. It's nearby. And then following that, we will go back to the hotel and at 8 p.m. we'll have this program I mentioned about the autobiography. Thank you very much once again. You've been a great audience today. Give yourselves applause. <laughs> See you downstairs. Thank you. 